The viewpoints expressed on Night Fright are not necessarily those of the host, the staff, the sponsors, or the affiliate stations. Tonight's program may contain graphic themes or images. Viewer discretion is advised. Showtime! Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome, everybody, to Night Fright. Relax, folks. This is your time. For the next two hours, we're going to take you on a spectacular ride. Get the coffee going, get the tea going, get a beverage of your choice going, sit on your most comfy chair, kick back, kick your feet up, for goodness sake, after being at work all day, and just take this time for yourself. Our guest tonight is a medium. Now, just let me read a little bit about Carolyn and her story. Carolyn was quite happy as a founder of Singing for the Soul and Quality Performance, coaching for public speaker and performers. Little did she know that in midlife, the world of spirit was about to let her know that she had the ability to communicate with the spirits of our loved ones who have passed over. Let me read that again. She has the ability, folks, to communicate with the spirits of our loved ones who have passed over. All those in spirit began to communicate with Carolyn. She knew that she was receiving an awesome gift and sacred responsibility. For years, she studied both in the United States and Europe to learn how to use her gift responsibly. She has become a popular psychic medium working in many countries. Her new book is Are You Psychic or Making It Up? <laughs> Understanding and Managing Your Psychic Self and Help Your Loved Ones Who Think They May Be Losing It. Her other books, of course, are Cosmic Connection, Consult Your Inner Psychic, How to Get a Good Reading from a Psychic Medium, and heart and sound. Carolyn is featured on Bob Olson's Best Psychic Mediums and has been interviewed on ABC News, Fox News, many internet shows, and the Boston Globe about her books. Her book, Consult Your Inner Psychic, won a first place award with the Coalition of Visionary Sources. So let me ask you, Carolyn, right away, when did you first recognize the fact that you had this wonderful gift? Did this just happen overnight? You woke up in an epiphany, or was this something that kind of occurred over a short period of time? Well, Brent, I always knew that I was psychic. Now, psychic is different from being a medium. But even from the time I was a little girl, I knew things about people who were living. In fact, I had a friend in my teens that I had a very psychic relationship with, and we sent messages back and forth to the point where my fiancé at the time convinced this friend of mine, Peter, his friend was Peter, my psychic friend, to be tested by the Psychical Institute in New York City. And we were tested for being psychic not mediumistic. We weren't saying that we were communicating with loved ones who have passed on. We were saying we're communicating with each other. There's a big difference. So I knew I was psychic, but I didn't see much point in it. What was I going to do? Why did I want to go around reading people's minds? In fact, I saw that as an intrusion, and I wasn't interested in being a professional psychic. I was full interested in being a musician, and that's who I was. Then in my 40s, one day, I'm in my house. I'm living in Mill Valley, California at the time, 
We're in County, gorgeous place. And we're getting ready to move to Boston because of my husband's job. And I see the spirit of my dog walk across the living room floor. My standard poodle, my brown standard poodle, had uh, passed on about six months before, and now I saw this spirit. And then things, from then on, things like that started happening to me. And I realized something was going on. So I spoke to a few people. By now, I'd moved to Boston. And I spoke to a few people who seemed to know about these things. And they said, maybe you're a medium. And Brent, I want you to know how much out of the loop I was. I said, what's a medium? I didn't even know the word. So not only was I not looking for it, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know there were people who talked to people who had died. And so that's how it started. It was kind of an epiphany. Were you nervous when you first found out, when you first came to that real no. no, because it was my dog who came to me. Okay. You know, perhaps it's some strange spirit that I didn't know had come to me. Maybe I would have been freaked out. But this was my dog. And the next person that came to me was the grandfather of my best friend. So if there are the powers that be who have some control on how this happened to me, it couldn't have happened in a more beautiful and sacred way. Plus, at that point in my life, I had taken up what they call channeling. I was going into an altered state of consciousness, having visions of things and recording these things. If, if you want to know more about that part of my life, read Cosmic Connection, because it's all in that book. But I was a channel, and even the voice that speaks to me when I go into the channel said, this is what you're going to be doing now, Carol. You're going to be communicating with those who have passed on. And I would say the most traumatic part of it for me, Brent, was not spirit coming to me, but I had a very successful business then with quality performance coaching. I was being flown to New York, working with top corporate companies there, being flown to St. Louis, and I was very invested in that. And one day, this woman who I had just worked with, I'm not going to mention her name, but she was big enough that she was on the head of Forbes magazine that month. And she said, oh, I can introduce you to all these people, you know, with your business quality performance coaching. And something in my heart said to me, no, you're going to be a medium. This is really important. So I didn't take her up on those recommendations. And I started switching. I started going to England to study. And it was, it was a spiritual calling. That's the best way I can put it. The way a priest or a minister or other people who in spiritual life might feel a calling. And although I know a lot of those people I just mentioned wouldn't approve of me, because <laughs> they don't all approve of spirit communication, but it was that kind of a calling. What is the need for a spirit to communicate? I can understand, you know, when a loved one passes on, of course you want to make sure they're okay and you're, you're mourning for them, your heart's broken in many instances. Uh, what is the reason a spirit wants to communicate with a, with a loved one? They've you know what? Mind? This is the best question you could ask and you're the first interviewer to ask this. And it's such a great question. And Thank you. Just send me your, your the, address and I'll get that check out to you right away. <laughs> No, the, the spirit has a great need. I've learned this over a period of time. In fact, a lot of times I say to my clients at the end of a reading, you think you just gave yourself a gift. You made the appointment, you paid for the reading, but you have no idea what you've done for the spirit of your father who just came through. And the spirits have needs for different reasons. Sometimes it's a general need. Um, but if I could list the needs, the spirits often want to let you know, when you think I'm around you, you're not imagining it. I really am there. And they prove it. They may say to me something like, I'm there right now, and there's, I'm, there's orange in the room. And I'll ask the client on the phone, sometimes it's a phone reading. 
is there any orange around you? And she'll say, well, I'm sitting on an orange rug. One time a spirit said she's sitting in a chair and she's wearing a purple sweater. And it was true. So sometimes the spirits will prove to me that they are right with us in this call. Other times, you know, and it's a little sad, but it's very emotional. Sometimes we have a spirit come through that really was not so nice to their family. And now in spirit, they're getting all kinds of wonderful spiritual help from the spiritual helpers. That's what I call them. I know that I, as a human being, can't really understand. So I call them spiritual helpers. Well, now this spirit has been helped and is, wants to come through to his family to say, you know, I'm sorry I was such a jerk and I apologize. Sometimes I have spirits come through who have taken their own lives and they really need to talk about that. So there can be some really big reasons. There can be small reasons. I had a spirit come through once to his wife and he said, I want my wife to know, this was the most amazing reading to me, I want my wife to know that the porch is starting to separate from the house. Now, I couldn't make that up. Why would I even think of something like that? And it turned out to be true. Another, another time a spirit came through and was able to stop a fire from starting in somebody's house where they... Um, it had something to do with wires and water. I don't know, but the client wouldn't believe me. This was actually in a demonstration at a spiritual church. The client wouldn't believe me. And I said, well, go home and check because some of these things are true. And that person called me a few days later and said, it was true. The fire department came. They unlooked, unhooked electricity, and you prevented a fire. So sometimes the spirits need to come through for a very specific warning like that. And I know that even in the religion of spiritualism, which I'm in, in which we believe in this, we really warn those who are opening up to spirit, please study with a good speak, a good teacher. This is, this is a real do not do it alone at home kind of thing. Why not? Um, is there an inherent danger in doing that alone? Can you well, let in? perhaps something that shouldn't be let in? Is that why you say that, you caution them? I say that, although I did it at home alone. <laughs> you didn't use a Ouija did. board, did I you? Did know, I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. But, and I wasn't freaked out. But some people who have started alone at home become very freaked out. And then it starts to become a very sensational thing for them, a very spooky thing. Instead of, for me, I'm speaking for Carolyn only, it, for me this is a very sacred, inspirational, miraculous thing that we're doing. And so you want that kind of support so that you don't get on that sensational track, which I think can be upsetting for people. Now, I go on all kinds of paranormal shows, you know, that do all kinds of spooky things, and that's fine. And I'm not putting those shows down. I'm just saying that's not the track that I'm on. And I love going on their shows to simply show that there's different ways we can be involved in this. The spirit wants to get in contact with somebody um, for whatever reason. And the person that's on the receptive end isn't sure if they're getting quite the right message. Uh, they're concern that they might be reading something into the messages they're receiving. Perhaps it's just a coincidence. Perhaps it's a fabrication. All the, all the above. How do you help people in your book discern between those? Well, first of all, people, when they read the book, will read about the ways that you might experience spirit. All right? So you'll learn that in the book. We don't have time in the show to go through all of them. But let's say, let's say Jane, Jane Smith, one day is, is taking a drive in her car to work, and she suddenly feels the presence of her mother, who passed on a couple of weeks ago. How does she know if she's making that up or not? Well, if she, what I would to ask her to do is to kind of memorize how that felt when she felt that and see if she feels the same time, way, 
every time she has that experience? Does she feel it as a kind of tingling in her body? Does she feel it as she's kind of in a dream? In other words, she has to get her MO. She has to get a description of how that feels to her, all right? And she will start to know what that feels like. Now, to absolutely have this proved to her that her mother is communicating with her, she may have to have, at some point, a reading with a good medium. So let's say Jane Smith calls me or another one of my colleagues for a reading. And she says to me, is that my mother communicating? Well, first of all, I have to try to communicate with her mother, get enough information about her mother that we both know this is her mother. I have to describe maybe what her mother looked like, how her mother passed, what their relationship was like. If I'm lucky, I might either get her mother's name or the name of somebody close to her mother. So now we know it's her mother. Then my client says to me, Jane says to me, well, ask my mother if that's her communicating. And I say to my client, well, if I ask her that, she's going to say yes, but I need her to prove it to me. I, I need the spirit to prove to me that she's in touch. So the spirit has to show me a moment in time that she was there. I just had a reading the other day, and I said that to the spirit. So I said, were you really communicating with your daughter? It happened to be a mother and a daughter. And the, 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 the spirit communicated to me that she was with her daughter when her daughter was talking to somebody on the phone. I think it was somebody like named Evelyn or Ellen or something like that. So I said to my client, your mother is telling me that she was there when you were talking on the phone with your friend Evelyn. Did you talk to your, on the phone to your friend Evelyn in the last few days? And the client says, yes, I spoke to her yesterday. I said, well, your mother was there. So the mother is giving us proof. Sometimes she'll say, like the example I gave to you before, I'm right there now and she's wearing a purple sweater. But I want the spirit to give me proof that they are communicating. But when this happens in a reading, it's the most colossal thing because then the client really, really believes it. Other than that, other than having a third party who doesn't know anything, because when I get on the phone with Jane to do the reading, I don't even know her mother's in spirit. I don't know anything. So for all that to come through convinces Jane. If she doesn't have a reading with a medium, which is fine, I'm not saying everybody should, then what she's got to do is to, as I said, get her MO, how does she feel when this happens, and maybe she can ask her mother to prove it to her in another way. Because spirits are sometimes able to prove they're around by projecting a sense, like maybe her mother wore a certain cologne or used a certain soap. So sometimes we know spirits are around us because of a sense, Sometimes we're lucky enough to actually see a vision of them, like I saw a vision of my dog. And sometimes um, the most usual thing is they'll come to us in a dream. And that's a whole other subject. How do you know a spiritual dream, visitation dream from a regular dream? That's one of my questions for you. Are they always positive messages, warnings, that type of thing? Can we reach out to spirit for guidance? I believe we can. Again, I always say to anybody who interviews me, I'm only speaking from Carol Lynn's experience. Yeah. There are a few pointers I'd like to give your viewers about asking spirit for guidance, if that's all right with you. Please, that'd be great. Ex expound on this. Just let me okay. tell people who we're speaking with. Folks, we're speaking with Carol Lynn tonight. She's got a book out called Are You Psychic or Making It Up? And easy way to get that, folks, as always, is www.nightfrightshow.com, www.nightfrightshow.com website. Just click on tonight's guest book cover, and that'll take you right to a spot where you can order it from the comfort of your own home. Back to Carolyn. Okay, so we were talking about asking spirit for guidance. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I first learned when I started traveling to England to, to study, not that they could make me into a medium, but as you said in the intro, they could, my teachers could teach me how to use this gift responsibly. They said, 
if you didn't listen to your Uncle Harry when he was alive, you have to be careful about listening to him when he's in spirit. Oh. oh. <laughs> so, yeah. so you don't always want to, to take the advice of somebody just because they're in spirit. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts for yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. I want to take the interview in a little bit of a different direction. I'm going to go out there with this question. The second you pass on, you must have thought about this because you're dealing with spirit all day long. The second we pass on, what happens that millisecond after our body stops? Well, I see it happening all different ways. I see spirits, like sometimes when I'm doing a reading, a spirit will take me back into their last hours of physical life. And they will show me almost a video in my mind. I don't know how they do that, but they show me that. And they show me that their spirit was leaving their physical body even before their physical body was declared medically deceased. It, and so they're kind of up in the ceiling someplace and they can report to me who was there and what went on. It's kind of like a near-death experience. We've all read stories of near-death experiences where the spirit is out of the body. Well, in a near-death experience, it's a near-death experience, and the spirit goes back into the body. In a real-death experience, the spirit doesn't go back in. So I've seen some spirits leave before their physical body is deceased, and that's usually when the body, the brain, is unconscious. I'm not saying that always happens when the brain is unconscious, but when I've seen examples of it, that's been the case. In other cases, um, especially like in an accident, or a suicide, or some kind of an unexpected sudden death, when I'm communicating with that spirit, the spirit shows me that it was a total shock. You know, that the, suddenly the spirit was like, whoo, out of the body, not expected, doesn't know where it is. Then I see images of either family members who are in spirit or helpers in spirit helping, coming around that spirit and trying to say, look, buddy, you know, you have had a very tragic, traumatic death. And then it takes that spirit some time to adjust. I hate to make generalizations, but at this point, I've done enough work, I can make some generalizations. But there's always exceptions to any generalization. Is there a light that we're supposed to go to? You often hear of people that had near-death experiences not going to the light, even though it feels like the greatest love they've ever felt. But they're not meant to cross that pl into that plane yet, into the spirit world, so they do come back. In your own research, I guess, or in your own experiences, do you believe there is that light? I believe that we as human beings call it that. I think everything that we think about the spirit world is the way that we see it as human beings. Good point. All right? Good point. Because I, I think it's beyond what we are even capable of imagining. All right, that's, that's what I sense, but I can't prove that. That's my feeling. So we see it as a light. I think there are spirits who, when they come out of the physical body, don't make it into that peaceful zone for whatever reason. They're kind of lost. We see it as them hovering below it. Well, that's our way. We, need a, we human beings need a spatial understanding of things. So they're kind of under that. And when I've been doing channeling, I've had many spirits come to me that feel lost like that. And I've had to tell them that that is not the kind of work that I do, but we will take the first few minutes of the channeling session to try to help them go to the light. 
there are, there are mediums and psychics who do what they call rescue work. And they work with those spirits. I don't do that because I don't feel, I don't feel that I can do everything well. You know, working as a medium, and there's, there's so many aspects of this. And I feel that my calling is to link with spirits who have made it into a place where they can communicate and to communicate, help them communicate with their loved ones still in the physical body. But I do believe there are some spirits that kind of get lost and caught and that the best people to work with them are people who do that all the time. I've joined those groups sometimes. They've asked me to come along, but I would never go as the lead person because I don't feel I have the, enough experience with that to, you know, what if something happens unexpected? I don't know how to deal with it. Whereas I've done umpteen readings, so I know how to deal with almost every situation. Uh, but I do believe that there are people who can do that, called rescue workers. Okay. When you're doing a reading, is it the same way every time? You know, I have that stereotypical, perhaps we all do, of somebody sitting near a candle, of course, right? Or a magic, uh, I was going to say a magic ball, a crystal ball. Um, I suspect that it's, it's nothing like that at all. Um, can you walk us through how you prepare yourself for a reading? Well, it is kind of like that, actually. Oh, okay um, then. <laughs> what I do, all right. This is a kind of a long answer, and if it gets too long for you, just go like that to me, and I'll, I'll shorten it. I grew up in a TV family, so I know all those signs. <laughs> Wait, don't tell me a Seinfeld episode, because that's where I came from. No, no, we'll, 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 maybe we'll have a minute from that. At any rate, um, all right. I found out, after I'd been doing readings for a few years, that although my teachers all told me, don't communicate with the spirit before the reading. Tell them they can't come to you before the reading. Hmm. But they all started coming to me before the reading, you know, like about an hour before. So I have to plan time for that in my schedule. So I go into my office an hour before my client either arrives at my office or I call my client on the phone, either way. And I sit down and I have on my iPhone a meditation that I've recorded for myself to listen to, where I'm kind of going down 10 steps. And it's actually not me going down, but I send a part of myself down. It's hard to explain that. But it's like I see a, a mini me that's all gold that goes down these stairs. All right? Then after I do that, I can feel the spirits around me because I start feeling sleepy. That's how I experience it. I have a lot of stones I like to work with. I can't say or prove that those stones do anything for me, but I have a, a rock that I found in Maui that's heart-shaped, and I hold it up to my heart. I hold a crystal in my hands. Um, I hold hematite in my hands. But, you know, I often wonder if it's the stones. I might be able to hold a bottle cap. You know, if I had the right oh, I thoughts see. in my mind. Mm. But I like to do this just because it takes me, I need something that takes me from my everyday life where I've just been to the grocery store or I'm taking my grandchildren to swimming lessons and I've now come back into this office where I'm going to go into a whole other world. So I need a transition to funnel me into that. So yes, I do a preparation. Now, I don't do a lot about protection. I know a lot of mediums do a lot about protection, and they do all kinds of different prayers and invoke different things. To me, I feel like if I make a big deal out of protection, it's like announcing to the spirit world that I'm terrified. So I'm, a, I'm assuming I'm protected because I just feel for me, if I'm sending out all this need for protection, if there are any kind of negative spirits around, they're going to say, oh, she, you know, here's a life one. <laughs> she's, it she's would act scared. more like a magnet than a protective veil. I don't know. I just, I just don't do a big deal out of protection. What I do is I assume I'm protected because I'm drawing the helpers around me that, that make it possible 
for me to do the work. And one thing I remember, and I want to stress this, it's a little off the point of the question, but this gift that I have, I don't have it. It doesn't belong to me. It's something that is coming through me that I feel I have been asked to do by a higher power, and it can be taken from me at any second because it's not mine. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brendan Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. One of the things, folks, I wanted to get to was the fact about religion and uh, God, if you will, in the spiritual world. Um, many people, again, when they have near death experiences, claim that Jesus comes for them if they're Christian. Um, in Judaism, they say no. Sometimes uh, Moses will show up or somebody like that, somebody that they're familiar with to guide them through. Is there indeed a God, if you will, in the strict sense that we've been taught? My background is Christianity in the strict sense that we've been taught in Sunday school. Well, I have to answer your question in two ways. First of all, I'm going to answer it based like a reporter. I'm going to report to you what I've seen as a medium. Then I'm going to answer it as Carol Lynn introspective person, and it's my own opinion. Okay? Sure. So first as, a, first as a reporter, I have had readings with clients, and all of a sudden I've seen Jesus, and I've seen a cross. And I've said to the client, you know, I am seeing Christian symbols, Christian images. So I am feeling that your family is Christian. And they've usually said, yes. I have also then seen candles being lit, and I feel like I'm in a Catholic mass. I may say to somebody, I'm feeling that the spirit we're communicating with was Catholic. Is that correct? And they've said usually yes. I've also seen the Jewish candles, you know, I've, so I've seen, I see the different symbols from the different religions, and it usually gives me a clue as to the religion of the spirit that I'm communicating with. So what does that mean? Does it mean that a Catholic is always a Catholic? I don't know. I don't know if the spirit's sending me those symbols to give me identification of their religion, I can only tell you what I've seen. You'll have to think about it and see what you think of it. <laughs> um, as far as my own feeling when you ask me, is there a God? Again, go to my book, Cosmic Connection. It is a wonderful sharing about this. And I'll tell you that for 20 years, I didn't allow myself to read any of the books. I read one book by Jane Roberts, but I went off reading all spiritual books for 15 to 20 years while I was doing my most serious channeling because I didn't want to be influenced by something I was read. I had read. I didn't want to feel that what I was channeling was just something in my subconscious. All right? So if you read Cosmic Connection, you're going to get Carol Lynn's view of God. And I view God as a presence. That's how God comes through to me, as a presence, as a creator, but not personified, not like a man, not like a woman, but like an incredible creative force that has formed the earth, that forms all of us, and that has a real effect on what happens. Do I think I can ask God to send me $100? I'll be honest with you, no. But I feel I have to interject, that... it's never worked for me either. <laughs> Usually but I... this is how I, as a channel, perceive God. So if one of my clients perceives God in a totally different way, I say, fine, you stick with your way. Because that's how your brain is put together and that's your best connection. Don't, don't use my connection, because you don't have my brain. And as much as I'm a, a human being who goes into the psychic realm, 
into this channeling realm, into this mediumistic realm. It's still going through my human brain. And I can't, don't think we can ever totally con, con, you know, disconnect that. Mm -hmm. If we have time, I want to add to that. Please do. We do have time. Okay. Well, people will say, is God talking to you? Is the Spirit talking to you? Am I hearing their exact words? I used to think so, yes. But by now, I've channeled and did readings for people where the spirits only spoke Chinese. They only spoke Japanese. And yet, I hear them in English. So I have to say, are they really speaking language as we know it? Maybe not. Maybe it's coming to me in a kind of energetic form, which I'm hearing as... Um, English because that's my language. An even more amazing thing happened. A client called me once from another country. Um, and she said at one point to me, I want to ask a question of my brother in spirit. I said, go ahead. She then went on for five minutes in another language. I couldn't understand a word this client said. Oh. And then, then she turns to me in English and says, what is the answer? And I just tuned it. I said to my spirit guides, you've got to help me in this one. I have no idea. So I just gave what came through to me. He said, well, he's talking about having the people in the family stop fighting. There's three of you who are fighting. I don't know what I said, but she said it was the right answer. Well, that experience proved to me that it's not about language. Because how could I get that? It was sent to me in a spiritual form that my mind translates to English. So I tell my English-speaking clients and English-speaking spirits that I am not claiming to get their exact words. I know that there's a translation process that goes through, and it will come out to you as close to it as possible. Okay. Now, I've got it by extension because we were talking about the positive aspects of spirit. And given the nature of the show and stuff, uh, I know there's evil people. And when evil people cross over, I suspect they retain the same characteristics, at least for a short period of time until they start to evolve. Is there something else that wasn't human called a demon? Your own perspective on this is fine, just speculation. Yeah. Well, I don't study this too much because I really don't want to be mixed in with demons. Okay. Um, in so in fact, heart, then by saying I'm that, gonna, I, gonna, I think yeah, you can, I'm going to yeah. answer you with my heart. Please. I feel there is such a thing. Mm. And I think that I think that it's negative balls of energy um, that be, have a life of their own. And I don't know that they're always, I'm saying this purely speculation. I want to make that clear to the listeners, okay? So don't don't chop a sound bite out here. <laughs> um, I think that sometimes it is our own minds that create the demons because negative people can project such negative thoughts, and this starts to form a ball of energy that takes on a life of its own, and I call that a negative projection. Sometimes when people call me and they say, there's negative spirits all around me. I say, well, first you've got to look to see, and these people are insulted when I say this. First of all, you've got to see if it's your own negativity that is creating these negative energies around you. Are you drinking too much? Are you taking drugs? Are you going around spooky places all the time? What are you, you know, let's rule out what you might be doing because you may have some part in it. I'm not accusing you, but I'm just saying you have to take a look at that. Then the next thing you have to look at is who's around you and what places you're going. Hmm. You know, are you going to a place where there's a negative energy or is there a negative energy in your house? And then I say, then they say, will you come to my house? And I say, no, this is for the paranormal investigators because that's not my job. That's not your gig, right? I get it. And that's, thank you. That's one of the best answers I've ever heard about the balls of energy. I think that makes perfect sense, actually. Yeah, where we can actually 
fabricated ourselves. Now, what are the inherent dangers? You know, it seems that ghost hunting has replaced softball on the weekends. <laughs> I used to go play softball. Now everybody seems to be wanting to get into this ghost busting thing. And I'm thinking they're playing with fire to a certain extent. Do you feel the same well, way? Ghost hunting, I should say. All right. If people want to study with me, one of the things they have to sure, assure me is that while they're under my tutelage, they're not going to do that. Okay. Because it's going to get in their way of developing the way they want to develop spiritually to reach spirit in the way they want to. Hmm. If, they, if they want to not study with me, fine, if that's what they're interested in. While I have great respect for the paranormal researchers who really study this, they go in with their equipment, I have great respect for them. I'm interviewed by them. I'll go with them sometimes if they want my help. Um, but they're, they know what they're doing. But these kids or adults who are like what I call, you know, haunted house groupies or junkies looking for thrills, I think that's a bad idea. Mm -hmm because you don't know what you might pick up. So I personally wouldn't go there, okay. but I'm not in charge of the whole world. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I should reiterate, I, folks, we've had many, many ghost hunters on this show, as you all know, and I go to my utmost lengths to make sure they're the authentic real deal because I certainly don't want to present any frauds to you, first of all, and I don't want to present anything that could be dangerous in any sense to you. And I think uh, yeah. all the guests that have come on this show have been top notch. Now, you had mentioned in the first part of the show that um, you're part of a TV family. And... Yes, I am. Okay, tell us about that, will you? Well, when I was a little girl, uh, my parents, this is going to show my age, but my parents were in the Armed Forces Radio in World War II. And all those people got drafted into the early days of television. And that's when it started. So my dad, whose name was Mort Werner, uh, he actually started the Today, the Home, and the Tonight Show. Wow. So I, grew, so I grew up, I used to be on that show quite a bit of time as a kid because it was the early days of television. And so, you know, for the holidays, they had the families on. Uh, for anybody who's as old as I am and watched Dave Garraway, they remember J. Fred Muggs, the chimp. Well, J. Fred used to play at my house sometimes. So that was a whole, um, you know, upbringing. And then before television, I was in the early days of radio as a little kid. We had a, a, TV, a radio station in Ventura, California, KTVEN, and I used to have my own show. So I was on the radio at 6 with Carol's Kitty Corner. Wow. So I guess, I guess you know, it's really exciting for me now, years later, to have all these internet shows because it just kind of takes me, it's kind of like takes me back to the early days of television and radio. Very much so. Which, it, which, which is my background. Yeah, we're broadcasting by the seat of our pants here, folks. And yeah, it's exciting so it's, as all get out. Yeah. It is very exciting, very sure exciting. Is. Now you mentioned your dad, is he, do you still have your dad? No, I don't. I have him in spirit. I was, there we go, you see? Uh, I was going to ask you if you contact your dad. Do you ever do that with personal relationships, people that have passed on? I do. Okay. And what's, been, what, what's been most important to me is that a medium brought me proof that she was on, in contact with my parents by oh. bringing information that she didn't know. When I was new to this, I had to have readings like everybody else to get that proof www.nightfrightshow.com, folks. Just click on tonight's guest book covers because there will be a bunch of them there and order the books. I encourage you to do wholeheartedly this fascinating woman and fascinating results with her uh, experiences and fascinating, fascinating facts and truth. So this is amazing stuff. My mother had a lot of problems in her life. And... I can remember when she first passed over to spirit and mediums would bring her through. She wasn't in the greatest shape, but she's been in spirit a long time now, and her spirit has evolved. When mediums bring her into me now, she's like this marvelous spirit. I feel that I actually have a better 
relationship with my mother in spirit than I had with her when she was living because of her problems. Uh, so something has evolved. Now this is nothing I can prove to you, right. but this is how I feel as a human being. When we pass over, do we retain our consciousness only for a short period of time, our consciousness? Yeah, I guess that's a good way of putting it, our personality. And then all of a sudden, as we grow, it kind of dissipates into white noise, if you will, and we join everybody else in this white noise? This is a great question. And it's something I think about all the time. Mm. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. Again, I'm going to say, this is only Carolyn's idea, my thoughts on this. I think we can we contain our consciousness for a very long time. Because I don't know how spirits that have been in spirit for 20 years would come through in readings and be so cognizant of their memories and of things that are going on with their loved ones right now. Like that a baby was born, you know, that wasn't born when they were alive. But I also have this sense, again, can't be proved. You know I'm somebody who likes proof. So I make a distinction between what's verifiable and what's not verifiable. What I'm talking about right now, non-verifiable. But I have this sense that the more we're in spirit, the more our consciousness is blended with all that is. But I also wonder if our spirits... Like right now, you and I are talking to each other. We're both spirits, but we're in physical bodies. We think we're really separate. But I wonder if our spirits aren't all joined while we're living too, except that in the human experience, we, our bodies and mental consciousness, our brains make us into individuals. But I wonder if we're really not as individual as we perceive ourselves. Because when I channel, I feel like I go into a very universal consciousness. Yeah. And I, I do feel that on a, on a, you could either call it a deeper and deeper level or a higher and higher level, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And again, those are human terms, high and deep. But I think we are all one. And I think in spirit, we are all one with God, with the God of your understanding. But there is an individual aspect of this that we live out in human beings, and I see and have experienced that spirits retain this. You know, and I also wonder, as an extension of that, and I'm going to go into the alien thing a little bit, but not in the hocus-pocus type right. of stuff. Um, no, you can be hocus-pocus. I don't care. It, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, we, if we go back to the Big Bang Theory, and I, I studied uh, Kabbalah and Torah in Montreal for a while under Rabbi New, and he explained that uh, life is like a seed, a, a tree seed. And when the tree grows from that, and the leaves and the branches and everything else come out from that, and then it drops another seed, and then another seed from that tree, and on and on and on and on. But it all goes back to the original seed. Everything that has come from that original seed is intrinsically joined. And I see that as the universe. I see that as this dimension, that everything is intrinsically joined. So even if there are aliens, they're part of us, we are part of them. And I guess what I'm asking you is, what is your perspective on what I've just described? On aliens? Well, you know, that we're talking about spirit in Earth, uh, in Earth terminology, where we're human beings. Is there spirit of beings that are not of this Earth? How's that? Is that a better way of putting it, perhaps? I'm getting well, really esoterical here. Um, no. My own feeling, again, this is not verifiable. Yeah. My own feeling is that there are. Mm. So I often ask my students, what if we lived on a planet and we looked <coughs> like mushrooms? Like what we as human beings on planet Earth might call mushrooms. What if that was our form? Would the spirits that we see, would all the angels look like mushrooms to us? Would we see them in our own mushroom form in the same way that we as human beings in this form see angels in our own form? 
So I feel it's very possible hmm. and probably likely that there are all different kinds of forms of intelligence out there in the universe. In fact, when I channel, I do not feel that I am reaching. I'm not talking about when I do mediumistic readings now. I'm talking about my channeling, where I started, okay? I feel that I am reaching a presence, a force, a creative force that never was a human being. You know, I've learned a lot of things. I, I now don't do any deep channeling without sitters. I have three wonderful people that meet with me once a month. I'm still channeling. And now I have people around me. They count me down. They're there to protect me. Okay. How okay, do they protect you, Carolyn? They protect me because if I get in too deep, and if they sense they need to bring me out, they, they say so and they start bringing me out. Okay. Or like when I'm in the deep channel, the ch I can speak in the channel's voice, but I can't speak in Carolyn's voice. Really? And, and I can't move, all right? But I can, I can tell with my mind. This sounds crazy to some of you, I know, but this is how it is for me. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. With my mind, I can tell the force that I'm channeling, look, I need to come out. This is too deep. I'm not, I'm, this is scaring me, or I don't, you know, you got to bring me out. Then the channel will tell the sitters, bring her out. It's time to bring her out. It's not an emergency or anything like that. I don't want to over dramatize this. But there are times where I need to come out. And there was a time in the channeling process where I would feel frozen. My whole body would feel frozen, and I would be in pain for two days after that because my muscles ached. So I had a long talk with my guidance. I said, this is no good. You've got to allow me to be able to channel without having to have my body feel frozen. Like we've been doing this now for 15 years. I don't need this anymore. <laughs> you know, I don't need a frozen body. So we worked on it over a period of months. And now I can move my feet. I can actually move my hands. And I can get the same channeling without having that frozen body, and I don't have any of those aches and pains. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So you, so, so you can work it out, but I feel better channeling that deeply with people with me. Understood. It's like a safety net, a safety valve. Now, when you're deep in that channeling zone, as I can't think of a better word, when you're deep in that channeling zone, do you, are you always cognizant of what you're saying, or is there at times when the spirit takes over completely and then you're just not aware of what they're saying, and then once you come out of it, people say, well, you know what the spirit said, and, and you don't remember it? Well, I have, I have chosen and asked to be aware. One, because I don't want to miss it. Hmm. And two, because I do not want to be, I'm not becoming a spirit. I'm not channeling a particular being. I'm not that kind of a trance channel. I am bringing through philosophy and advice for my sitters. They ask questions and the channel gives them answers to stuff I don't even know anything about. I usually feel as if Carolyn is sitting up in a sort of perch mm -hmm. outside my body. And I don't remember all of it or hear all of it but I do hear it, and sometimes my mind is fighting with what's being said. The channel is saying something to one of my sitters, and my mind is saying, how can you say that to her? You know? <laughs> so sometimes there's disagreement. So I feel it as two separate parts of myself. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first-person witness accounts for yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. We're going to have to start to wrap up. We're coming Aww. to the end of the show. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's been so much fun. It sure has. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes left. Is there something you want to leave the folks with? Well, I really want them to read this book. It's called, Are You Psychic or Making It Up? I want you to read this book, not because I'm going to become a millionaire author, because I'm not. <laughs> but the reason I wrote this book is for you.
because people like you have been calling me, emailing me, asking me all these questions. And while I would love to spend two hours on the phone with each and every one of you, I can't. You know, I'm only one person. But I've taken your questions over the years, and I've answered them in this book. So it's, it's a great read. It's written very conversationally. It's not expensive. And I just think that you'll be really happy that you read it. So I want, I want to give you this information. And it's the only way I can give it to you is through this book. So and, that's what I would say. And the book is called Are You Psychic or Making It Up? Triple W dot night fright show dot com triple w dot night fright show dot com click on to next tonight's guest book cover that'll take you right to a spot where you can order all her books her uh connections will be there if you want to get in touch with her and become a student of hers all kinds of things there for you on the night fright website as well as archives of old shows, some of the shows that I mentioned tonight, as a matter of fact. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. I want to thank Carolyn for joining us and stepping up to the plate and helping out showing up tonight because we had two guests cancel in, uh, geez, just under just under 18 hours, two guests canceled. So uh, thank you so much for coming. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. You're a terrific guest. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed it. Maybe next year you'll be here doing your shows from Hawaii. That would be great. Yeah, if you adopt me, I will be. <laughs> Hope to see you again, Brent. I've really enjoyed this a lot. Me too. Thank you so much. Very special person. Thank you. I'm okay. Brent Holland from everybody. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. See you next time. JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com. JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now. Nightfrightshow.com.